Yeah, good. Well, thank you very much for coming in tonight. Um, welcome to SAE Byron Bay. Many familiar faces, some new faces, which is great. Uh, let me first introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jan. I'm one of the lecturers here. Uh, I've been here at SAE Byron Bay since 2006 and worked for SAE before in Hamburg. Uh, that's where I'm from, from Germany. And uh, tonight I would like to welcome you to our Harrison Mixbus uh, showcase. So um, I want to do a few things completely differently. We start with a thanks. We just work in reverse order. Um, and also in reverse order, we start with the audio team first for a change. So let's mention Tiani and Tiani, Tiana, sorry, yeah, as our sound team for the evening. <coughs> then, um, and Shannon is around here somewhere as well. Hey. You were helping? I saw you helping there, so thumbs up. Thanks, Shannon. Then we have um, Miha and Phil on the video cameras. Thank you very much. And from the student council, we've got Melissa, Jeff, and Mitch. We're helping out with the refreshments, so... Always good to have, thank you very much. Um, from our management side, uh, we should mention our manager, Ben, and of course, Holly in marketing. This is Holly, who was extremely helpful in um, setting all this up. And uh, last but not least, we should mention uh, Ben and Mike from uh, Harrison, who were so kind to donate three envelopes with uh, licenses for the software that we're going to draw later today. So these guys have been extremely helpful. So thank you very much to Mike and Ben. Thank you. Good. So um, has anybody ever heard about Harrison consoles, the actual physical analog or digital consoles? Um, they've been around for quite some time, and um, they have a fair um, a reputation. Um, let me just switch to my projection. So I would like to um, quickly go to the website here. This is a part of the Harrison website. I want to be very quick on this, and we'll get to the juicy stuff straight away. But um, there's a picture of Dave Harrison, the founder of the company, um, who used to be a sound engineer and then started to design consoles and work together with MCI um, and develop consoles, and later had his own brand of consoles and um, among those were some spectacular analog consoles that um, to a certain degree shaped the sound of the music history, you know, like uh, some famous Michael Jackson records were done on um, Harrison consoles. Uh, we should mention Bruce Swedian, who was one of the best sound engineers in the world, in my books at least, um, who yeah, turned mixing on Harrison consoles into an art form. Um, <coughs> so they've been around for a long time, and they've got a reputation uh, for um, high quality um, mixing consoles, but they were always a bit of a niche market. No, they were not as widely recognized like SSLs. No, they weren't one of the really big players, but they always had the reputation for spectacular consoles. Um, and nowadays they produce software, and that's what I want to talk about today. So let's just go in straight away and introduce. Oh, let me just close this one. Um, to start from scratch for a second. So um, this is how it looks like. Um, Harrison Mixbus um, opened from my dock on the bottom. That's the logo. Um, we are currently working in version number four. It came out just a couple of weeks ago, and when I used it for the first time, I knew, okay, I got to talk about this. It's important enough. I've uh, been using Harrison uh, since version two, Mixbus, and uh, my history, as uh, I'm a Pro Tools user, uh, I have to admit, and uh, have used Pro Tools for a very long time. Um, and I'm, I still am a Pro Tools user, just to be perfectly clear, straight up. Um, but over time, I started to use Harrison more, and uh, with version two, you know, learning a new door is a fairly painful process, especially if you're really settled in in one. And uh, I really know Pro Tools like the back of my hand. So starting in Mixbus was a little bit bumpy for me at first. So I started a mix, didn't get really far, and moved back to Pro Tools. And then I started the next mi mix, gave it another shot, and got a bit further, but it went back to Pro Tools. And eventually I got to the point where I finished a mix and realized, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm getting the heck of it. I understand how it works, and I'm learning the workflow. But um, there were a few things in version 2 that I didn't quite feel were quite ready yet. They were still developing, 
uh, 3 was significantly better, and they've made a huge step forward again with version 4. Um, so that's why I think it's time to introduce that. Good. Um, let me just zoom in into the new session um, setup window. Um, nothing too scary here. We just want to start with a brand new session. I've got my list of um, recent ones. Um, let's start maybe on the desktop with a test session. Oh, I used that already. Let's make it two. Good. And um, it opens up uh, this audio and MIDI setup window where we configure our audio and MIDI devices. And uh, there are a couple of things that I would really like to point out that are special. For example, the separate settings for input and output. I'm using my audio interface today, which is a Moto H96 HD. And uh, I would like to configure it for input and output. But uh, if we just consider this for a moment, um, there are still a lot of people who are used to their doors and, you know, work in Logic or Ableton or Pro Tools, um, and they want to start to use Harrison mainly for mixing. So getting the files across from one door to the other is usually a fairly painful process, and it's not very s simple and streamlined. Uh, this said, there's a little trick that we could consider. Um, on a Mac, at least, there is um, Soundflow available, which is a virtual audio interface to connect one door to the other. And um, in Mixbus, you can set the input and output devices separately. What that means is I could use my Pro Tools, for example, to play back audio into Soundflow on individual channels, route it into Mixbus via the input, and from there connected to my uh, converters. I've tried it for a while, um, and it worked fairly well for me. I was actually uh, quite happy with that. Did lots of testing you know, at 96K, even on my little laptop. I got it to run fairly smooth. And then with a little bit of trickery, I actually even worked out to sync up transport via virtual MIDI drivers, which uh, was actually pretty, pretty smart, I've thought. But in the end, Eventually, I moved on to mixing mainly in Mixbus you now with a um, simplified workflow. Good. Just want to point that out. It's a possibility which, at the beginning, made my transition a little bit easier into, into Mixbus and helped me to actually have two doors open at the same time. But you will need a fairly beefy computer, obviously, for that. Um, the next thing that I would like to point out is that um, the buffer size um, is important. Uh, generally, we want to keep that small for recording, as you may know already. Um, however, in mixing, it's usually good to open it up a little bit um, and allow the computer more time for processing. And um, currently, it's set to 1,024 samples. Uh, that's what I have available in Pro Tools. And under certain conditions, I can trick Pro Tools to have a buffer of 2,048 samples, uh, which I often need because my mixes tend to get a little bit larger. Um, however, mix uh, sorry, oh, that doesn't show at the moment. Okay, I'm probably in the wrong sample, right? But um, I had it at uh, 4,000 samples, and uh, I'm not quite sure why it doesn't show up at the moment. I might need to switch sample rate for that. No, okay, show effect. Yeah. I'll try that again later on. I'm pretty sure that it works. It went up to 4,000 samples, which eventually allows you to um, work with uh, more fairly complex mixes. Phil, have you used that buffer size? Have you used higher buffer sizes? Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Let's get it started. So um, this is how it looks like when you open it up, and. Um, yeah, if you know some doors already, you might find that it looks fairly similar to a door by the name of Ardor, which is an open source um, audio workstation. And this is exactly what we're looking at. So um, the Harrison guys joined forces with uh, open source software and literally combined their mixing engine with a pre existing um, door, which is Ardor. And the um, sessions are to a certain degree uh, compatible which is uh, certainly good to know. Um, and um, 
Yeah, therefore, um, you will find that Harrison Mix Bus works on PC and on Macs and also on Linux, which is really nice to know. So it's a f really broad um, system that works on all kinds uh, of operating systems and it's very user friendly. So you can really decide what computer you want to use there. Um, I guess that makes perfect sense. Um, when it comes to plugin, uh, first thing that you probably want to know is can I use my pre existing VSTs, for example, or other plugins? Um, the first thing that you need to know about Harrison is you pr probably use your existing plugins a lot less than in other doors because there's a lot built in. This said, um, they actually support um, another plugin format, uh, LV2 um, plugins, which is uh, yet again an open source uh, format. On top of this, they just opened up um, Harrison Mixbus in version 4 for VST and AU on, uh, on the Mac, which is fantastic. Now up to version 3, it was only AU on, on the Mac, and now we have literally everything uh, that is fairly common, uh, except, for, of course, for AAX, which is uh, Pro Tools only, and that will probably never change, and that's not Harrison's fault, of course. So we actually have a, a door that is super compatible, and um, you will find that your plugins will probably work well. Good. Um, let's just start with a couple of tracks. So let's get started. Let's create, let's say, um, some 10 audio tracks, for example. The choice of tracks is uh, pretty common. Um, we've got audio MIDI. We've got audio buses. If you're a Pro Tools user, that's the equivalent of an auxiliary. Uh, we've got the same for MIDI. And we also have that's new VCR uh, masters which at the beginning I was like, yeah, nice to have. I probably wouldn't use it. But once I started using them, I pretty quickly adapted to a workflow that included them. So they are pretty, pretty nice to have. Um, and then we'll just start straight away. So what have we got? Um, it's a standard door. We've got a timeline on the top. We've got tracks from top to bottom. Um, to rename a track, you just double click. You probably guessed that. Or right-click is another possibility. Or we also have a list on this side here, uh, which can be shown and hidden. Um, it makes sense to, to look this up because at the moment, we are in the tracks and buses view. The projector doesn't fully show that. Can you actually read that? Yeah, yeah you've got to turn your head a little. Uh, the projector seems to shave off a, a centimeter on the side. Um, so we've got different tabs here, and at the moment this is the area where um, we can configure our channels. We can it's a convenient area to move channels around. So if I import audio files, a whole bunch of them, chances are they come up with A to Z, and that means you know, your snare drum is further at the end, and the bass is before the kick, and all kinds of things are wrong. So moving tracks around is fairly easy on this side. Um, we also have a regions bin, which is the equivalent to you know, the audio window in Logic or uh, the regions bin in Pro Tools. Um, and a few other things, tracks and buses, groups and ranges and markers. That's something um, a little bit different. Uh, markers, I hope you've all seen before, little markers that we place along the timeline to indicate a certain point like um, a chorus or a verse. But we also have ranges. And they're here at the bottom. Yeah, um, ranges are a length of a selection instead of just a point, uh, which I found uh, fairly useful. Um, they can be used to create uh, CD tracks, although this is probably not a very modern workflow. Does anybody still remember CDs? You know, from the Middle Ages when people had you know horses, carriages, things like that. In these days, uh, CDs were around. I'm not sure if I, uh, I'd personally use it, but some may. Um, I I find the range is very useful because um, when I print my mixes, I rarely finish in one take. Or my mixes are often different versions. I start with a rough mix and then the first mix and I realize it was a bit rough still, so I update my mix and update it again, go through different versions. And every time I print my mix or bounce my mix, I recall this range, which is a given selection. Consequently, every single bounce I do is exactly of the same length um, which, well, it's not mandatory, but um, I've been in a situation once where my client couldn't decide between two mixes. Uh, I had version 3 and version 4, and then eventually we used the chorus from 3 and the verse from 4 and simply edited it together. 
And in this case, it makes a lot of sense to have the mix of exactly the same length, so they align perfectly. Not that this happens every day, but you know, it's a little trick that I wanted to show you. Good, okay. Um, one feature that I would like to point out is under session, import PTX files. And that got me really excited because that will uh, literally allow you to open up a proto session and steal the data from there. I have to admit that it's currently in beta stage, so it's not fully developed and uh, I've had good and also bad experience with that. It doesn't always work and that's why it's a beta. However, it's worth a try and it can simplify uh, your life a lot if you start with one door and you want to move on to the mix bus for mixing later down the track. Yeah. Good, okay. So, now that we've got all this um, out of the way, let's actually look at the juicy stuff. Let's go to the mixer. And here's the mix window. Uh, this is how it opens up. It looks fairly busy. And just on first look, we're almost ready to, to start mixing here. So we can see that we've got all the tracks on the left-hand side, um, audio 1 to 10 in my case. Um, if you want to rename a track, just right-click the name and give it a name like, I don't know, kick or something. Yeah, that's fairly straightforward. Um, and above, we can see that there is a fairly large section which lot with lots of controls. And um, let's start from the bottom up. Uh, we have a pan control over here, left, center, and right panning. Um, right next to it is a green little button which routes this channel signal into the master output. And that's a good thing per default. The 10 um, pots above are actually group sense, and they route signals from their post fader into our 12 mix groups. Harrison Mixbus is equipped with uh, 12 uh, mix buses in the 32C version. There's also a smaller version of Harrison Mixbus, which uh, has eight of them, which is still pretty nice to have. So where are these buses? They return here on the right-hand side. Just close this down for a second, make a bit more room. So on the right-hand side, we've got the buses. Visualize them as subgroups. It's exactly that. And then from there to the master. Um, in other words, it's basically configured like an analog console, where you've got your channels on the left, then the subgroups, and then the master. And that makes me feel right at home. It's just something that I really respond to, uh, the analog mixing style. To route a signal into uh, one of the buses, you literally click the button. You have the ability to adjust the volume separately, independent of the fader. But um, I often find that um, I barely use those, actually. I just turn them on. Uh, however, that depends on the workflow, of course. Uh, then above, we find the EQ section, which in the normal mix bus uh, section are fairly simple, but great sounding three band EQ. Uh, in mix bus 32C, come on in please. Yeah. 32C, we've got a four band EQ, which is modeled after a legendary console by Harrison, the 32C console. Um, it's actually not the first sort of called plugin to emulate uh, this EQ. There's also um, a UAD plugin. Are you familiar with UAD or Universal Audio? Uh, they have their own plugins. It's a format that works only with uh, UAD hardware. And uh, they modeled the same equalizer from an analog console and they called it Channel 17. Because apparently the story, the myth is that uh, Bruce Swedian's favorite channel was the number 17. That sounded just best and he used it for vocals if I remember the story correctly. Um, in order to run the UAD plugin, obviously you need to buy the hardware and the software. It's built into every single channel here, straight up. And that's really nice to have. It's fairly simple. If you've used EQs before, we've got a low cut at the bottom and a high cut. They're switched on with the same button. Um, they actually turn themselves on the moment you grab them. So the moment I adjust something, they turn themselves on. And then we've got four bands for lows, mid, low mids, high mids and highs with a tunable frequency. Um, for the highs and lows and the lows, we can turn the shelf into a bell, which is probably all the EQ you will ever need. Um, 
In addition, of course, we can load other recues. Every once in a while you need to do a very surgical, super narrow um, knot, for example, and then it might be useful to load any plugins you may own already, um, a fab filter or what, what, what have you, Mac DSPs. Um, and that's all possible, of course. Um, then there's just one more thing that I should point out here, and that's not very common on um, indoors. Um, it's the trim control right here. And this is conveniently placed right next to the fader. Although it's close to the bottom, it actually sits at the very top of the channel strip. So when the audio is played from the hard drive or from the editor window, the first thing it hits is literally the trim button, or the first volume control, and it allows you to turn it up or down, just like a trim on an analog console. What that means is that gain staging becomes an entirely new game. Um, if we were to, let's say, load a plugin, let's say over here, I would simply right click in the empty area and um, go to my plugins. Let's say I would like to uh, load Harrison's look ahead compressor. Harrison's have their own plugins, and uh, what they all have in common is they are great sounding, every single one that I've found so far and they only have the controls you absolutely need. They're simple, they don't have a huge interface with super advanced, confusing controls. They're just the bare minimum. And uh, this is one of them, a compressor. So if I wanted to, I could now play with the gain stage and crank the input up over here to hit the compressor harder. Yeah, and uh, that has a different effect to moving the fader up because obviously this is post insert, or is it? Well, if we think about basically every single door on the market, uh, we will find that the insert sits somewhere on the top, and all of the processing with plugins happens before it hits the fader. And that is a good thing in many situations, but I've had situations where I needed to automate a fader um, into a compressor. So I wanted to hit the compressor with a certain amount of gain reduction and just automated my fader so that the compressor stayed within its sweet spot or comfort zone, as I call it. And let me point out something at the top here. Right on the top, we've got um, yeah, a signal for diagram where the signal travels along this green line, first through the EQ, then through the compressor, then to the fader, and at the moment, into my look-ahead uh, compressor, the plug-in that's open. And have a look, the fader is actually before. If you don't like that, just move it up. So all the plugins can be either before or after. If I wanted to, I could move my channel compressor, which I haven't even mentioned yet, post fader, if I wanted to. And this is a feature that I actually I never really knew how much I missed it until I saw Harrison. And once you get used to this feature, it's actually pretty hard to go back to other doors that don't have the feature because I g I'm getting used to it and it's a feature that becomes essential to, to my mixing workflow. Good, okay. Bless you. <laughs> um, then there's another section that I would hi I'd like to show you. It's fairly hidden and it's right on the top. They decided to hide it in version 4. Um, it used to be visible all the time in previous versions and I'm just using a little trick, I hold on shift and click this area and it will open up an input section here where there's a fair few things we can do. Um, first of all, let me point out a face reverse button built into the channel. The face reverse sits right at the start where the uh, input trim sits as well. This should be a feature um, in every door, I believe. I can't really understand why that's not the case. Um, I did a bit of research on you know, um, digital processing, and uh, it literally comes down to calculating a change of one bit, the first or most significant bit, into um, each sample. It, you multiply it by negative one, and that's basically it. So it's a fairly simple thing from a digital audio signal processing point of view. And they've built it in. I believe everybody should. It's just a feature that, once you have it, you need it all the time. Good. Uh, also, we have the uh, inputs here. And um, when I first played with um, 
Mixbus, I realized there were a couple of things that really bugged me. As a seasoned Pro Tools user, I was very much used to do to all, do to selected, and key commands that would assign inputs in a sequential order. And um, changing things here, yeah, it's okay. You can click in there and just change it like this. Um, but I wasn't quite right at home yet. Uh, that all of that changed um, when I discovered interesting we actually can't see my menu bar on the top I guess that's due to the projector I'm in the Windows menu and from the drop-down menu there's a little um, routing window by the name of audio connections and uh, that is a window that it took me a moment to get my head around but when I got it it really changed the way I, I, I work because it makes things a lot easier so let's try to get our head around this little window here so we've got on this axis the source and it's the buses the tracks uh, misc section and hardware so source hardware that's the inputs then at the bottom we've got destinations which could be tracks or misc or hardware again so at the moment I've got my kick channel no, getting signal from input one and so on and if you want to change this you simply click and draw a line and you do something like this uh, let me just aim right oops sorry draw this again and the inputs are set for many channels with one single uh, mouse move yeah. at the moment I also have a couple of double connections and it's uh, as simple as clicking them to remove connections so um, if you've seen the Pro Tools IO setup you might be familiar with uh, similar views and they simply designed the same thing to connect inputs and outputs which makes perfect sense to me yeah, it allows to yeah, set inputs very quickly um, other things we have here are uh, it's just the ability to connect everything to everything here. So we could literally connect hardware within uh, Mixbus. I could literally connect my hardware inputs, hardware source, to my hardware outputs directly. Now that can be useful in some situations, for example, to pass talkback through or have a consistent signal always going through uh, your audio interface, no matter what you do with your session. Um, now we've got the... Um, Buses over here, we have a, a d designated output for the click. So we can route our click to either the main output or any output that we want. No need to set up a channel for it. It just clicks by itself and you just tell the software where it uh, needs to go. Yeah. Um, you may also find that uh, there are things that other doors don't necessarily have. LTC, longitudinal timecode or SEMTI timecode, is used for synchronization. Uh, in video applications or if you want to sync up your computer to let's say another um, computer or tape machine maybe and uh, that's not a standard feature not every door has that and it's just uh, really nice to see that they actually thought about the professionals here good okay everybody good with this so far questions at this point yeah cool excellent Let's check my notes. Okay. All right. I'm sure you're keen to actually hear something. So let me just close down the session and um, move on to a production that I am currently working on. Uh, save and close. So, and let's start with a new one. Okay, that's loading up. So, um, what we're currently looking at is um, a recording that uh, we completed uh, some time ago, and we are basically at a stage where we still need to do consider maybe a couple of overdubs. The mix phase hasn't really started yet, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how a mix can be approached. So, um, the files are imported simply, I consolidated them in Pro Tools and then imported the new files. After trying every single combination, I believe this is probably still the quickest possibility if um, the import PTX uh, feature doesn't play ball, which it sometimes doesn't. In this particular case, it didn't work too well for me. So we've got the um, track names in there. The moment you import audio, 
um, um, it pops up straight away with the audio file as the track name. To import audio, you would go to session and import. Explains itself. From there, you can navigate around. And uh, there are a couple of good, good features in the import uh, section. For example, we can uh, take autoplay and preview files, so you can work out what you're importing, if it's the right or wrong file. Um, we can also do little tricks like uh, the mapping, which is can be useful. Uh, in case of stereo multi-channel um, tracks, you can decide whether they are placed on a stereo channel or on dual mono. And every once in a while, you want to have it one specific way. Um, okay, and MIDI tracks or um, virtual instruments will map automatically to uh, some of the um, synthesizers that are built in. It comes with a few. Um, and yeah, it's a fairly comprehensive uh, window um, that would probably explain itself to you the moment you uh, use it for the first time. Yeah? Good. So we can have a look on the right hand side. I've got my track names here. And. Um, yeah, there are a few things that we can do from here. So um, if I solo a channel, it actually changes the light up there. And if we have a look at these buttons, they will have a meaning. And they're actually quite, n quite nice to have. S stands for solo. Um, that highlights the solo channel. And from there, you can also solo over here. Yeah. It's, it's a very useful way if you've got a fairly large session and you can't see all of the tracks at once then this is a very uh, nice way. SI stands for Solo Isolate, and uh, that's a good thing to have at times. Um, at the moment, I'm using a mode by the name of Solo in Place, uh, which actually cuts all the other. That's why these icons are on. As you can see on the top, it says M for Mute. And if you want to prevent a channel from being muted, you can Solo Isolate the channel. And now these will sound no matter what you do with your solo in solo in place. Yeah, that's pretty nice to have. And this is just a very convenient way to, to manage that uh, in just one small overview. You, know, you don't, don't need to scroll sideways to find your tracks. It's very easy to find. By the way, we also can record enable and record save um, sections over here. And um, then these two tick boxes here is uh, um, visibility, so we can show and hide a track. Yeah, so I can just take it away. Oops. We scroll to the top. Yeah, so the kick in was just hidden. And we have A for the active state. So we can disable the track here, which every once in a while comes in really handy. Everybody cool with that? Just some nice features there. Let's finally play something back, shall we? Spacebar, of course, will be um, transport. So this is a recording we did. And just note that at the moment, there's nothing set. The uh, faders are all at unity. If you don't mind me fading out here at this stage, I would like to give credits to the Jesse Morris Band, dear friends of mine, spectacular musicians, locals. I love these guys to bits, and it's always a pleasure working uh, with them. Um, it's a song that's literally raw as can be. It comes right from the recording session. No mixing has been done at this stage. However, we try to record it in a way that with faders at Unity, we've got already fairly balanced mix, and there was a little bit of total processing, but nothing too crazy. So let's get started, shall we? Um, working in groups is something that is just very beneficial in Mixbus. So the first thing that I would like to do now is to set up um, edit and mix groups. Um, to do that, we look at the tracks we want to uh, group. For example, we've got my kick here and from the kick up to the toms and also the room mic. All of this I would like to place in one group and then I would like to have a different one from the bass. The way to create a group uh, is fairly simple. There's a little gray bar here on the top. And with a mouse, I simply drag it across until I have the end of it. So I want to go up to this room channel. And now let's give it a name. 
drums. Here's my group. Yeah? And the next one is for the bass. This is a fairly, s fairly smart and uh, fast workflow. If you're in the uh, other window, by the way, you can do the same. Can you see on the left-hand side, blue and green? Yeah? And to enable and disable a group, guess what? It's just a click of a button. Yeah? So it's very intuitive and uh, fairly well designed. Yeah? Good. Um, so let's just keep going. We've got a couple of guitars here. All of these are guitars. And uh, now come the keys, and then horns and vocals. So was it four channels? Yes. Keys, and a couple of saxophone channels, four of them. The saxophone was uh, basically recorded with uh, extra room mics, so it's got a really nice uh, roomy tone. We can blend this together nice nicely laid it on the track, and the rest is all vocals. Good. Okay, so why is all of this useful? Um, I can now use a couple of tricks. I would like to group my um, entire production into subgroups. That's why I have a few mix buses ready to go. And if you want to harness the sound of mix bus, I strongly suggest you work into subgroups. In other doors, you may or may not see the advantage of it, uh, in Harrison, it really makes sense. So how do we do that? I would now start holding Shift and Command and click uh, the green button that assigns uh, the channels into the Mix Master. In other words, we just lost our sound entirely. But now we go back to our groups and give them names. So let's say we would like to start with the drums. I also want a bass group. For two channels, you may argue it's not really worth it, but I just like to do it for the sound of it. Yeah, um, then I had my guitars. And uh, next up were the keys. And um, now we seem to be running out of subgroups here, but we have more. So four are the standards. And from the view menu, you can open up the mixer list, which opens up a little tab on the left-hand side where there are a few little things that we can um, do here. One of them is show and hide channels um, in the mix window. And at the moment, we can see all our audio tracks up to here. And now we've got a few um, subgroups over there. So how many do I need? I've got drums, bass, guitars, keys. I need horns and vocals. So I just show two more. And there they pop up. Yeah. We can have up to 12 but it might not be convenient to have all 12 in view all the time. So we want to go to this one, and uh, I call it horns, and then vocal. OK, so now that I've got my group set up, the edit groups will link the group assignment. So if I go to the kick now and click the button that assigns the kick to the first group, this will apply to all the group members, thanks to the, to the edit group that I created there. That's a smart little workflow that saves you a little bit of time. And um, then from there we move on. So the bass goes into two. The guitars will go into three. The keys go into four. Then we've got the horns in five and the vocals, last but not least, in number six. So. Yep, I've got them all. Okay, so the next time I play back, all of the audio channels will now play through the subgroups. And uh, let's have a quick listen. I brought the volume down here. Yeah. Good. Okay. I can already hear the mix behaving a little bit differently. And the reason is that uh, all of the subgroups are equipped with a drive control over here. And you can see the amount of drive in the VU star meter right above. Um, this is a feature built into Mixbus, which sits on every group. And it's a drive control that will simulate analog tape sound. What it effectively does, it adds a third, fifth, and seventh harmonic 
So the odd harmonics are added in a certain degree that is just very pleasing to the ear. The, um, yeah, harmonics, it's, it's distortion in a way, but good distortion, so to speak. And uh, I find that these are actually among the most important things when I put a mix together, because that provides a lot of glue, the sense of belonging, the sense of a mix falling into place that I just don't find in any other door in the same way. So let's just bring up the, the volume a little bit and play with the drive. really like the mix a lot more just because we pass it through there and it does a lot of things for me that I need to work hard in other doors and it just seems to fall into place easily. Within the subgroups we have um, a three band uh, equalizer built in which I don't use too often to be perfectly honest. Every, every once in a while just add a touch of brightness there. Uh, we also have um, in this case a balance control um, which I usually just leave dead center because I want to do all my panning on the channels, but in some workflows it may be useful. And new in version 4 is stereo width control, which allows you to adjust the stereo width excuse me, and narrow the stereo image if necessary, um, which can be really nice. In the keyboard section there are a few um, sounds that are just a bit too wide and you know between left and right a bit too out of phase, and it can help to uh, control it right here so that in the final mix eventually it pops up the right way. Um, on the very right hand side we've got our master fader and if we have a quick look here. Um, yet again we have another drive control. Above we've got a K14 meter. Uh, ideally admire Bob Katz and all his uh, art forms and skills and his technical knowledge and thanks to Bob Katz we have the K system and the K14 meter is built right into the console which is fantastic. Um, I person personally wish I could switch that to K20. That's my preferred choice. Um, so far that's not possible, at least not in this meter, but I can show you a workaround later on. There's another possibility. Then we've got an overall drive control, which drives the entire mix bus, so to speak. And built in as well is an inbuilt limiter, uh, which can be useful for people who mix and master at the same time. Um, I would suggest to just you know double check with the mastering engineer. Mastering engineers are often happier to receive a mix that has not been limited. You know, just to, to consider this, but some people just mix and master in one workflow step in uh, Mixbus. Then of course we also have our trims again, and the trim sits uh, before the drive control, which is good to know. So you can literally balance the trim and the fader differently to shape the saturation and the thickness of each sound, which I qu quite enjoy. Yeah. Good. Thoughts so far? Yeah. yeah, starting to make sense? Yeah. Good, fantastic. So what do you think? What does this mix really need at the moment? Reverb? Yeah. Reverb okay? Reverb for the vocals? Yeah. Any other ideas? <laughs> Sorry, it's sub drop. <laughs> 808. <laughs> well, it's an acoustic recording, and, and our idea is to actually dub delay. Dub delays would be nice. Um, so, how do we do all this? Um, to, to create time based effects, you can simply use one of the remaining six um, groups and use them for time based effects. I personally prefer to use send routing for all my time based effects. It has certain advantages that have become important to my workflow. So it could be as simple as going to the vocal channel, turning on number seven. I could then show Mixbus number seven and throw a, a plugin in there. Um, and that's a very good workflow, generally speaking. However, I personally prefer another choice. Instead, I would now go to add one audio bus 
and we'll make it stereo. And it's a personal workflow thing, but I always keep them on the very right. It means uh, right next to my uh, to mix buses. And let's call this, let's say, vocal reverb. And um, let's get started. I would like to add a plugin from um, Harrison here. Here's the uh, Harrison Reverb. Uh, it's uh, an LV2 plugin format, which is uh, specific here. Um, by the way, now that we're looking at the plugins, um, not all of them are free. Some of them are, and every single one is great. Um, Let's say if um, I started a production and passed it on, let's say, to Phil, and you open it up uh, on your computer, and I used a Harrison plugin that you don't have, it will still sound, because it's built into the software. It's still there. Just opening up and adjusting it um, won't work in the usual way. It just opens up for a short time, and then after a short couple of seconds, it grays out because you may not have the license. Uh, but it will still sound, so that's basically built in. Let's get started with this. Here's the reverb. If you need to adjust it, you could email me back and give me the session back. But every once in a while, uh, there's actually a trick that you could use by yourself. If you right-click a plugin, um, there are the controls. And controls that you use all the time, your go-to control, the most important thing, um, in a reverb plugin, for me, that's certainly pre-delay and reverb time, I would say. So reverb time, I want to tick. Yeah, and right there shows up the reverb time. So you don't actually need to open up the plugin. You can keep, keep it closed in order to adjust the reverb time. And this feature is available even if you don't own the plugin. However, it's a bit more of an inconvenient way to operate it. And uh, sometimes I found it works perfectly fine. Um, I love the sound of the de -esser. There aren't many good de plugins out in my books, and this one is spectacular. And I found it just wasn't satisfying enough to use the controls. I wanted to see the interface. Um, so that was one of the examples where it didn't work for me. But uh, there are quite a few where you might be perfectly happy just working out of the controls to somehow evaluate um, the sound of them, and eventually you may decide to, to purchase additional plugins if they grow on you. Which is really nice to have. So, how do we get the um, effect or the signal into uh, the reverb? I simply go to my um, main vocal, right click in this area, and instead of new plugin, I would now go to New York Send, and there pops up my new newly created bus, in this case, the vocal bus. And it's my personal choice and my personal workflow to combine the relevant effects with the dry signals within their relevant group. In other words, my vocal reverbs would not go into the main mix directly, but instead into, what was I using, group six, I believe, so that I'm now taking my dry vocal from here into group six. I also send a proportion to the effect unit, turn it into a reverb, and the reverb's output also travels into group number six, where then the saturation or any group compression I may apply somehow massages the reverb into the uh, signal, if that makes any sense to you. That's just my personal choice of um, um, routing the signals together, and all of this is uh, nicely possible. Good, so let's have a quick listen. Maybe go to a section where there's uh, some vocals further down the track. It's nice to have this area on the top, where you can navigate along the timeline. And let's open up some reverb. Mm. Yeah. So here's the reverb. Um, for, um, for effect return channels, I would now usually um, solo save um, my, um, my return. And that is done just like in Pro Tools with the command click on the edit window in that column on the right hand side as I showed you before. So that now allows me to actually hear the sound um, or the dry signal with their relevant reverbs. He's not singing at the moment. And I adjust the effect width over here. Um, 
I have to admit that very rarely I actually move away from the default reverb because I've tried a couple of presets and I just love the default sound so much that I barely ever move to any other ones. There are some good pl sounding plates in there. It's very simple, straightforward, and uh, yeah, makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Okay, everybody cool with that? Any questions at this stage? Let me show you some more tricks. Let's have a quick look at the kick drum. We all do love a bit of a fat f kick drum, don't we? Yeah. Good. Okay, let's work on the kick drum. I've got a I've got uh, a kick in here. It's a microphone directly inside the sound hole. Uh, sounds very typical for that. Um, and I'll just turn it down again. Here's the kick out, yeah, which was a sub kick uh, microphone, which is very dark and round in tone. And uh, I would like to show you a little plugin that when I first saw it, I just couldn't believe that nobody else has thought about it. Um, who likes MIDI? Who works with MIDI? Quite a few of you guys. Yeah? So you're probably used to certain features that you can apply to, uh, to MIDI, like transform features. You can probably transpose and scale things and, let's say, limit the velocity. And one thing I've seen in MIDI, or used in MIDI quite a lot, is a MIDI scale, where you have a linear shape for all the velocities, and you can scale it into a curve, which brings some certain node v velocities up and some uh, some not. And we've got the same thing built by Harrison and it sounds spectacular. So what I would like to show you is my favorite plugin called Dynamite. So let's try to see what, what that actually means. Over here is a linear shape. Yeah? And that basically means that each volume is scaled exactly as it, it should be at this stage. So a quiet volume yeah, is here and loud is over there. If I turn it to the right-hand side, can you see the curvature? It curves certain volumes up. But loud signals still end up where they were before. Um, and on the left-hand side, it will do the exact opposite. In other words, it will, to a certain degree, work like a gate. Let me just solo the first kick. Have a little, yeah, there it is. You can probably hear a bit of spill there. There's other signals in there, and on the kick in, I would really like to get a fat round punch. So what I really want is the attack there. So I move it to the left until it starts to work. Yep. I've got a bypass here if we want to. Yeah. As before. Can you hear how it now sounds like the drummer really means it? Yeah. It's just quite gutsy. And my trick for a really nice fat kick drum is to do the exact opposite on the kick out. If you're used to other doors, you may know exactly what I'm about to do. I hold an option, drag a plug-in across, and there's a copy of the plug-in. But this time around, for the kick out, I do the opposite. So on the kick out, I bring it up, which now makes the ring of the kick longer. Yeah. So this is before. And let's just check how it all sounds together. Let's just solo the drums for a moment. Mm. Am I too loud? Mm. Okay. Good. Okay. Let me just fix something for you. Okay. We need to go to the hardware. And you're using analog one and two, yeah? Thanks. Okay. Good, okay. Yeah. I'm feeling the kick better now. It might still need a little bit of work at this stage. Yeah. I just found this to be an extremely useful tool uh, on drums that really helps to shape the envelope uh, in a certain way. That's just, yeah. Has anybody ever come across a plugin that does that? I still haven't. That's the only one I know that does that. It may exist, but I haven't seen that. And it's actually really useful. <laughs> well, a transient designer, um, they're all designed differently. And um, 
a transient designer somehow amplifies the transients or s reduces them. So in a transient designer, typically you would have one control for more or less attack, and at the same time more or less sustain. And in a typical uh, Harrison fashion, they simplified this even further to one single slider that does either one or the other in a very intuitive way that just sounds great to me. I wouldn't really call this a transient designer, but it, on drums it can have a similar effect. Yeah. Yeah? It can have a similar effect. Yeah? Good. Everybody cool with that? Let me show you another plugin that has really grown on me and uh, that I, it's hard to work without. Uh, Harrison has got the character bundle, and among those are his drum character, bass character, and vocal character. Let's start with the drum character and mono on my snare top. So what exactly is going on here? This is an equalizer that has two different settings which you can apply to two different times along the envelope. What? If that doesn't make any sense to you, that's okay. Let me just clarify this. Let me just clarify this. Let me just solo the snare for now and just have a quick listen. So, the moment I... Um, the moment I start playing, the section at the bottom here actually reads the envelope. So basically it can see the sharp rise of voltage and then the decay tail that is common for, for a snare drum. Now we've got the slider for A and B and by moving it sidewards I can now set my section for the EQ A over here attack and B for the tail. That means I can now apply an EQ for a very narrow amount of time just on the transient. So on my snares, yep, I'll approach the end here. On my snares, I really like to um, to add a little bit of smack. Yeah. There it is. Before. Yeah. After. It's a bit much, maybe. And I often go into actually a uh, um, bell shape EQ and try to tune it to an area where the snare really bites, often around 4K. And if you just hold down, was it control? Sorry, if you just, uh, if you just use your mouse wheel, you can adjust the, the Q factor or the width of the bell. Then the next thing I would like to do is just amplify the fundamental a little bit. So I can turn on the other band and now tune around until I actually find mm, the fundamental. Ideally, I want to tune this pretty much exactly to where the fundamental sits. And uh, now it depends a bit on ear training yeah, to really get that right. And you really want to narrow this down really well. And we'll probably find it close to the 200 mark here. However, every once in a while, you just want to uh, find out for sure. So let me show you a little trick that I use. Um, let me just scroll to my snare channel. There it is. I make a little... Uh, let me just turn the group off, sorry. Without a group. Now I select a couple of snare hits, right, just like those. Right click and do a little spectral analy analysis. That's how long it takes. Yeah, and I can now see the spectrum of uh, all the sounds in there. When you move your mouse over, in this case, that's pretty clearly the fundamental. We come at, at approximately 190. Yeah. So if you're in doubt or if your ears are starting to getting a bit fatigued, there's a very quick way to just find the fundamental and in this case I could tune it to in that range. Usually if you're a couple of hertz off it doesn't really cause too much trouble, but uh, it's a very quick way to know for sure. And that's just a good thing in general I'd say. Yeah. So let's just see how it behaves at the moment. Yeah. Good, okay, let's see what we want to do on the tail. Let's add a bit of lows to the to the tail. Before. Yeah. Good. Okay, you want to look out for this white little dot here, because only when there's a little dot uh, lighting up, then, on then only then it works. So we've got a threshold here that I need to pull yeah, a bit further down so that on every snare that was played, the EQ actually starts to, to kick in. Yeah. And that's the rim clicks where I really want it. So on the rim clicks, I actually would prefer to have a bit more of the fundamental and maybe even a bit wider. Yeah. 
good. What do you think? Again, I have not found any other tool that does anything like it. And it achieves a really thick and full uh, drum sound in no time. So that was the port or you have to purchase it? This is an addition. Purchase. Yeah, um, it's worth it. It's worth it, I'd say. Um, and that's the additional plugin that you now work in Mixbus? Yes, these plugins will only work in Harrison Mixbus. You cannot load them in Logic, Pro Tools, Ableton, what have you. They have they? On the Linux, you can run the plugins in hardware. Oh, okay. So yes. Hard, uh, we do take a look for clean and clean that's a good point. That I didn't know. I just learned something. That's fantastic to know. Okay. Well, Pro Tools doesn't run on Linux, unfortunately. So, therefore, it's not possible in Pro Tools, so to speak. But, okay, that's actually good to know. I didn't know that. I thought they were actually Harrison Mixbus only. So, that's really good to know. Good. Okay. So, that's a plugin that once you get your head around it, um, it really changes the way I mix. And so far, I have not found anything like it in another software that helps me to create a polished, punchy, and full round drum sound just like that. With, you know, just a few little moves. Um, good. We just saw that we had a red light coming on. Yeah, that means that uh, I amplified the signal a bit, so it's now appearing to clip. And when I say appear, I actually mean it. As long as you record any red light, of course, is a big, big no-no. That's when a converter clips. But once signal has been recorded without clipping into the digital domain, we work in 32-bit floating point internally. That's what Harrison does as well. And that means that any clipping in the mix actually now leaves the 24-bit that the audio file has, and we start to use the uh, floating point algorithms, the Mantissa and stuff which in some cases could theoretically still clip if, let's say, we had a 24-bit uh, plugin. But so far, I found that all of the plugins I use are 32-bit float, which means they don't actually clip. It's okay as long as the gain is reduced at the other side, uh, on the output stage. I know that some people will now uh, hate me for saying that, but yes, it is okay in some situations to clip because it doesn't clip. You get just got to know where it, when it actually clips and when it doesn't. Everybody cool with that? Some good features here? Yeah. Uh, while we're at it, let me just quickly show you another plugin that I really enjoy. And it's the um, for the bass. Uh, let me try the Harrison bass character, which is a very simple plugin. looks just like this. So what we've got here is yet again two EQs a lower one and a higher one, and it currently comes up with uh, B and C, um, I guess bass character. There's no A here, so it must be bass character. Yeah, And uh, at the moment, uh, on the left-hand side, we reduce gain a little, and on the right-hand side, we gain something up. So what does that do? Let's have a quick listen. Just show only the one bass signal. Yeah. So this is before. This is after. So what am I doing here? The lines that you see here are not labeled with frequency. Usually we would find hertz here. Hertz or something like this. This is the fundamental, and here are the harmonics. This is a pitch following EQ. So if the uh, bass player plays an A, it will automatically tune itself to a fundamental of 440. If it's a C, uh, let's say the C above, then it will tune itself up automatically. So the EQ follows the bass performance. And that is pretty spectacular. I found one more plugin that does the same thing uh, by Sound Radix, the uh, Surfer EQ, which I dearly love, but gee, it doesn't always get it right, and wow, it's hungry on the CPU. I don't want to open up two or three of them. Now it's really hungry, and for good reasons, and I found that this was fairly light on the CPU, works really well, and at this point I effectively reduce the fundamental a little and bring the harmonics up, which gives it a lot of clarity in the, uh, in the mix. You can turn it into a shelf if you want to, which gives it a bit more brightness in the top end, and now we can get off a lot of that stringy sound, 
which is often very good in the mix as it you know, starts to cut through. Yeah, and that's another tool that I dearly like. Yeah, it's a very useful tool, um, and it's literally in every mix on my bass channel. Good. I completely from forgot to mention all the compressors we've got. Yeah. yeah. Well, how come I forgot all those compressors? On the bottom of a channel. Well, we gotta ask Ben or Mike at Harrison how they exactly do it, and chances are they might say, "Well, we won't tell you." <laughs> yeah? uh, that might just be their secret. Uh, I guess they have come some kind of an analyzer internally, yeah. working out where the fundamental is, and then from there multiply where the harmonics are. But that's just an assumption. I guess that's their trade secret. Yeah. yeah? Cool. You know. They probably won't tell you. Imagine you knocked on uh, on, on Coke's uh, door and said, "Hello, could I please have the recipe?" You probably wouldn't get it. You know, or if you are, so it's probably the same with plug-in manufacturers. They keep their cards protected in a certain way, if you want to call it so. Yeah, good. Um, let me just go back one step earlier. I completely forgot to mention the inbuilt compressor that we have on every channel. There it is, right next to the fader with the threshold, an output gain and only one control, which in my case is um, an attack time. You can then choose between three different settings. The leveler is actually one that I use most. And yet again, a leveler is not necessarily the compressor plugin that you find in every door, and the ones that are out are not always great. But this one is. A leveler allows the natural dynamic to poke through very well. It just keeps the volume a, l a lot more consistent then we also have a normal compressor, where our pot then switches to a ratio. And uh, you could, if you wanted to, also use a limiter no, to really attack the peaks and uh, reduce gain very quickly. So with these three choices, you can literally do anything you want. And I often find that um, they sound so good that I actually want to use more than one. I often have them running across the... Uh, individual channels, and then again, just a little bit for the tone of it, across the subgroups. Um, really nice feature to have. Let's just give it a try on the bass. Uh, so come start with the leveler. Uh, you pull the threshold. For the leveler, you have to pull it fairly low, because it ignores uh, peak level quite a bit. And that's when it starts to reduce. Yeah. And then you just add a little bit on the output. You can bypass it up here. Yeah. And when we listen to it now, I don't hear much of a difference, but the difference becomes audible in the mix, usually. In the mix, it just suddenly makes a lot more sense. You don't really hear a compressor at work, as in pumping or leaving an audible mark on it. It just keeps all the notes just a bit more audible. While without the compressor, I sometimes feel a couple of notes dropping off the edge. Yeah. Good. I probably just need to start finishing up soon. Yeah. How are we traveling for time, Holly? Ten past. Okay, good. All right. I actually had a n few more plugins that I really wanted to show you, but that's okay. I think that was enough for now. Um, let me just show you one or two more things that I believe are quite unique and that make Harrison quite special. It needs to be configured in the properties of the relevant session. If it's ticked, you can open up the monitor section. A monitor section is just like the center section of a mixing con um, console where you have a volume pot. And this is built into um, this piece of software. Example. Let's get started from somewhere here. You can adjust volume from within the software. I can go into presets. Well, is that a reason to get really excited? My interface has, has got a volume pot, so I've got it already, and it might even be better to have it outside. But um, there are a few things that I dearly prefer to have, like a mono button. To just quickly test your mix in mono. How does it translate to mono? That, again, should be an every mixer, I believe, and I, I dearly appreciate that they didn't put it into the master, so the master is actually still fully stereo. 
it happens only host master in the control room section, where it should be. So when you check your mix in mono, you know whether it's mono compatible, so my kick is here, snare, but I would now really focus on effects and other things you know, that are panned wide and see if they are still uh, translating well. Every once in a while you want to hear the difference, the exact opposite of the mono mix. So you actually want to check how it sounds if it's mono sound out of phase, which basically means everything that is in the mono channel, mid channel, will disappear. And we can do this up here. We've got buttons where we can mute individual channels, for example. You can listen to only one speaker at a time. You can dim the speakers if you want to. Or solo, which is the exact opposite of mute. And here's inverse. So when you inverse a channel, obviously one channel goes out of phase. If you then mono sum it, you can hear the remainder or exactly what you would lose if it was mono summed. And I find this very useful. This is a feature that is built into, let's say, the custom series yeah, and uh, some other big, large-scale consoles. But in software, that's not a feature that I come across very often. And uh, please don't forget to turn it off when you print your mix and so on. Yeah? But um, this is a feature that is uh, very useful to get an understanding, a deeper understanding of what's happening in the mid-channel and in the side-channel. If there's a lot of energy in the mid and next to nothing in the side, chances are your mix is not stereo enough. And it really brings it out to me. Good feature? Yeah, yeah cool. So, yeah, just like on an analog console, when you press the talk back, it will dim your speakers. And that can happen here as well. So, um, yeah, we've got a, a dim control over here. So, dim will now reduce the speaker volume by, uh, in my case, 12 dB. Yeah. Good, that's really cool. Then over here are three buttons for the solo modes. This mixer um, provides solo in place, the behavior that we saw earlier, where you solo one channel and every other channel is cut. But it also provides AFL solo after fader listening, which will not cut the other channels. And that can be useful in case of people, let's say, working live. I know about a few people from online forums that actually uh, use Mixbus for live shows on their computer. And obviously in a live show you don't want to hit solo and only one signal remains. Yeah. Uh, in this case, AFL can you be used to route the AFL output to a separate output connected to headphones. Nice one. Everybody cool with that? Good. Okay. It might be fairly hard to impress people who are used to big consoles like James Boundy, who you know, knows the SSLK inside out. And there's one more solo mode that the, is really good on this console, solo in front. And that's not a solo mode we find in every piece of software. However, we can trick Mixbus very easily. It's literally built in to do. What is a solo in front? A solo in front will not isolate the signal but it will just leave it in the mix, just bring it up a certain amount. And we can do the same thing over here if we go to the solo cut, which is currently infinite. In other words, everything else is just cut perfectly. But I can also, let's go to a preset, let's say go to negative 12. What does that mean? Let me go back to my mix somewhere. So I want to know what's happening on the room. Suddenly, my room microphone elevates in the mix. Yeah? Let's check the, um, the saxophone that's playing. No. Ah, just missed it. Now the vocals come up. Yeah. So you basically keep your signals in the mix. They just jump up a little bit. And I believe that this makes a huge difference when you make EQ decisions. I've had the situation often that I solo a signal and decued it and thought it was great and place it back in the mix and it's like, where is it? That didn't make sense. And it also works the other way around. You know, I've had situations where I cued it in the mix and it sounded great and then I hit solo and it's like, what? How can that sound good? It's horrible. But back in the mix is great. So the only thing that really counts is how it sounds in the mix and solo in front can really help to make the right decisions because you hear it in context.
but still it's magnified, so to speak, so it comes up in level and it really helps you to make the decisions right. Yeah? Good. Good stuff? But there's one more thing. <laughs> in the control room section is one more section which is known as processes. And I've got to be a little bit careful in advertising this because that can be careful, it uh, can be dangerous. But let's be perfectly honest, most of us, we don't have a highly treated, acoustically perfect control room to mix in. We often mix in bedroom studios or places like this that have no fairly okay acoustics, but usually some issues. In this room, for example, I know there's a certain build-up around 160 to 250 hertz. So you can open up a processor and throw in something across only the monitor path. For example, an equalizer. Let's say this one. This is Harrison's mastering style equalizer. And if I wanted to use this across the monitor path, it will be audible all the time. But it doesn't sit across my master. So if I print my mix, this EQ is not included. If I work against, or if I try to correct for acoustics, this is probably exactly what I want. So how does it work? It's a third band. So I can just find the frequencies and I simply draw it in, just like this. Yeah? Um, let's say I wanted to raise the highs a little bit. I just draw across like this. I find that the EQ sounds different than other graphic EQs because what I don't hear is the typical bell thing. You know, if you bring a couple of sliders up on a graphic EQ, you don't get a flat frequency response. Actually, you get you know, spikes. And this one doesn't do it at least not audibly to me. No. And uh, now we have basically an EQ inserted across the monitor path. And if I hopefully you know, fight uh, this correctly, then it will actually improve the listening experience. Obviously, this should not be done in the middle of a mix. But in a test session before you start mixing, when you calibrate your room, and be very careful. There are certain things you can EQ against and others you cannot. For example, everything that happens in the bottom end is usually standing waves. And the nature of a standing wave is that in a certain spot, a frequency builds up really loud. But if this happens, there's another spot in the room where it's too quiet. EQing against this doesn't work because it's, it will always provoke this kind of behavior. But you know, other things like a certain build up in the upper mids, uh, just to a certain degree, you can EQ against. Acoustic scientists would now actually throw something at me and you know, pull the hair out. But to a certain degree, it can help to improve a room if it's done well. Everybody cool with that? There's just one more thing that I want to show you. When starting to mix drums in particular, um, many engineers don't start with EQs or anything, but they start with the face button. Just see the face relation between all the drum signals and just try the face button on different channels and try to find a setting where just by toggling the face the right way, signals sound stronger and louder. And I believe this is a very wise way. But let's think about this for a moment. A face button has two positions, on or off. Uh, I've got, let's say, let's say I had eight drum channels. How many buttons would I have to press to find out every possible combination? I would be clicking for quite some time. That's actually two to the power of eight, which is 256 times. Th in other words, there are 256 ways to toggle the face between eight channels. And I've got a couple more. Well, let me show you something. I would like to select an area where I've got all the drum signals. So I've got a couple of toms here that I want to be part of it. Also my room. And I just highlight across them. I will not choose a very long section because I know this is a fairly hefty process.